Hey guys, what is up? Niat here with Film Comics Explained, and we are back with some more Aliens. Picking back up with book 3 of the Aliens anthology, Female War. The first two books saw us following Hicks and Newt in their attempts to survive the onslaught of xenomorph encounters that came their way. They both witnessed the outbreak of aliens that decimated the planet, and were fortunate enough to jump on board one of the last few cargo vessels to leave Earth. The ship automatically took them to a facility of nightmares, led by a psychopathic general who had intentionally allowed a xenomorph outbreak to occur on the nearby civilian settlement for research and the development of a xeno army. Determined to develop an army of xenomorphs loyal to him, he set out on the task of training the queen to instruct her kin to follow his command. These lessons were folly, as we discovered the loyalty of the xenomorphs had never swayed when he arrived on Earth with the army, only to be betrayed by them. Hicks and Newt made it to Gateway Station, and were both very happy to see Ellen Ripley, who had just entered the bridge. We returned to find Ripley, explaining that when she was young, she knew a little girl named Rebecca who lived on LV-426. The adult colonists found their new home cruel and unrelenting, but the little girl had known nothing else. To her, the planet was home. She only wanted what all children wanted, the warmth and security of family, the human connectedness that comes from belonging. However, what she got was a nightmare without end. We can see an adult xenomorph chasing after a terrified newt. As the demons raged, Rebecca sought shelter in the cold steel maze beneath the planet's surface. She wasn't mature enough to understand the true horror of her situation. Perhaps that was all that saved her. To the child's eye, the soldiers were as frightening as the monsters, with the exception of a corporal named Hicks and Ripley herself. Out of the Marines, only Hicks survived, if you would call what happened to him survival. But through it all, Ripley was there for the little girl, and in the end, she prevailed. Ripley goes on to say that she watched her as she fell asleep, before attempting to find her own peace. It was over, and they were going home. For the first time since it started, she could dream. We can see a man standing beside her sleep chamber, who says that she is coming out of it. Ripley wakes up and asks him how long she had been asleep, and he replies by saying, three days. She is furious, having expected to be waking up on Earth a few weeks later. The man then tells her that the mission isn't over yet, and we see her calling them bastards. They are walking from the Salako to his ship, as Ripley asks the captain what he is doing here. Hankerson explains that they have been analysing the Salako's transmissions from the time they entered planetary orbit, telling Ripley that he's noticed she's becoming an expert on LV-426. Ripley replies with, yeah, through attrition. She then tells him that it doesn't matter as a terraforming reactor had gone critical. Hankerson explains that the facility is history, but corporate have an insurance problem and are interested in something else. Hankerson asks if the names Dallas, Parker, and Kane meant anything to her. She tells him that he knew they did, before saying they were the crew of her first ship, the Nostromo. They'd picked up what they thought was a distress signal from LV-426. After landing, Dallas, Kane, and Lambert went out to investigate, and it started. He tells her that the tapes were lost after she self-destructed the Nostromo, but to her surprise, he reveals the footage from Kane's helmet of their preliminary recon of the derelict ship. This proved that the Earth had known about the creatures from the start. The inboard recorders logged everything. The Nostromo's android dumped the data into the escape pod's computer long before she took care of him and the ship. Ripley then impatiently asks if they work her up for advice. She then says, if Asheron is still intact and any of those things are alive, drop a nuke and waste them. Hankerson agrees that the Xenomorphs were monsters but the space jockey represents sentient life capable of navigation and construction. Ripley then points out that the aliens put his sentient life out of business, the same way they destroyed the Nostromo, their marines, and the colonists on Asherah. She explains that she pulled a partial translation of the alien signal and was certain it was a warning before storming off. Hankerson tells her he was going to make it easy for her. It was a scientific expedition and he merely needed a guide. Ripley walks back to the Salako and tells him that she is never going back and that the discussion is over, but we see him yelling out that she doesn't have much of a choice. She stands over Newt's sleep chamber and tells us that she had seen Hankerson's kind before, full of the mindless bravado that comes from ignorance. We're told the Marines set the Salako's automatic guidance system for Earth and gave her an hour to prepare for their mission. She had spent those last minutes with Newt and tells her that she would have done anything to protect her including going along with Hankerson's mission. 
Ripley looks at the Salako from the marine ship as it drifts off to Earth with Newt and Hicks on board. She grabs one of the rifles and tells us that Hankerson's marines were so much like the others. She didn't want to get close to them as she knew they weren't going to make it. One of them asks her if she knows how to handle the rifle and Ripley says, Regulation blaster, 500 round mag with two inboard clips, medium recoil, poor at distance but a real mother up close. She throws it over to the grunt and tells her she thinks she can manage. She then tells us that she knew what they were thinking, that the marines on the Salako died because they messed up, but their team was better, tougher, and meaner than that. She also points out that the Salako crew felt the same way about the Nostromo, before saying that their almighty technology had lulled them into believing they were somehow superior to the alien. The dropship begins to hit atmosphere as Tully points out that Ripley doesn't think much of them. Ellen tells her it doesn't matter what she thinks, as if it did, they wouldn't be here in the first place. Tully thinks she is exaggerating and insists that it will be an easy in and out science probe, but Ripley assures her that this will be more than a photo opportunity, implying that the company wants to bring something back with them. We're told that Hankerson stayed with the lander while she rode with the marines in the APC. The marines were still dealing with the mission on their terms, equating it to their lock and load drills back on earth. As soon as they saw it though, they began to understand. One of the grunts explains that the shockwave from Ripley's barbecue kicked the crap out of the derelict ship and is now playing hell with their communications. They are essentially losing contact with the lander's main relay board. They move inside and confirm that command believed there may be transferable navigational data on board the alien craft. Their primary objective, however, is even easier. They want a living specimen of the alien brought back for study. They continue to move forward and begin to pick up movement 50 yards ahead of them. The Grunt asks Ripley for advice and she tells them that some of the Xenomorphs must have survived the detonation and returned to the derelict. She tells the sergeant not to push it, insisting that they were safer outside on open ground. We then see Hankerson's face pop up on the monitors, yelling at them not to evacuate. He tells them that Ripley is there to provide tactical advice, but he was still in command. We can see several figures moving in on their position. Ripley tries to get them to move away, but the grunts don't know what to do. One of them takes a few steps forward and falls through a crack in the ground. The grunts look down and ask if he is okay, and he tells them that he can't move his legs. We are told that it started slowly, an electromagnetic synthesis she can't pretend to understand. The marine must have triggered some sort of power source inside the alien vessel. It was more than simple energy, it was an intuitive living force. It took control of the APC's system, reprogramming the tractor's smart computers to understand a new language. It followed his life support signal like an electronic snake entering the APC's communications deck. The readouts flickered with a litany of indecipherable information, all that was left of the dead pilot's mind. We're told that Derelict's computers spoke to her. It was the rest of the distress signal she'd picked up aboard the Nostromo, except this time she could understand it. She saw the telemetry of information, star charts, tangent reference points. Ripley tells us that she felt her strength, her utter supremacy. They assumed the alien infestations were sporadic and arbitrary, that they bred wherever convenient like some horrible cancers. But they were wrong. They moved with a purpose. The pilot of the derelict ship had discovered the alien's genesis, the source of their power. Ripley explains that she is calling her children back to her. We can see the Xenomorphs are less than 10 yards away and closing in. One of the soldiers reaches in and tells Masters to give him his hand so that he can pull him up, but we see a Xenomorph in a teeth project out of the front of his head. The soldiers look around and then lean forward in confusion before looking up to see the Xenomorph as blood begins to drip down on them. We then see them beginning to open fire in all directions. They are slowly becoming surrounded by the creatures and we see the sergeant tell them to concentrate their fire as the hull was already slightly compromised. We then see bits of the ship beginning to fall down on them. Suddenly, it stopped. She felt the alien images drifting away, leaving only a piercing, hollowing roar. The residual hum of the dead jockey's last warning. We see the lander go down near the APC. A figure hops out and runs towards the vehicle. We see Hankerson running in, telling Ripley that he can't bring up the squad's signals as it was being jammed. He approaches her and asks her what was wrong and she explains that the message they intercepted was by accident and wasn't actually meant for them. Hankerson asks what she saw and she replies by saying, course trajectories, starfields, the alien's genesis and a mother's desire. Hankerson 
grabs her and tells her that it was better than he had ever imagined. He pulls her to the lander as he explains they will transmit the coordinates back to Earth, or they will have a ship armed and ready within hours. Ripley asks what they will do about his squad, and he simply states that they were dead long before they touched the ground. He goes on to explain that the corporation's genetic team thought they could use them to breed specimens, insisting that it didn't matter, but he is then immediately shot in the back. We can see it was one of the grunts on the APC who tells him it mattered to him. Tully, Ripley and the other grunt then lift up towards the Harrison. She had seen what the corporation would do to retrieve one of the creatures, asking us to imagine what they would do to track an entire planet. We're told they detonated the APC from orbit, terminating the last of the corporation's specimens. It would take weeks for a second military vessel to reach Asheron, but it would come. Sooner or later, they would piece together what happened. Sooner or later, they would be coming for Ripley. Unfortunately, that's all that we have time for today. I really hope you guys have enjoyed this one. Please let me know your thoughts in the comments below. If you enjoyed the video, don't forget to hit like and to subscribe to stay up to date on all my content. Also check out my Patreon if you'd like to support the channel, and please don't forget to subscribe to my Facebook to find out what content is coming out next and when. Alright guys, stay awesome. Niad here with Film Comics Explained. Thanks for stopping by.